This is a Zidu X10 Pro media player I bought on Amazon for 350 bucks uh, a couple of days ago, and it just arrived. Uh, this is basically a, a computer you stick under your TV, and it plays media files for all your, you know, illegal torrents and whatnot. Not that I would ever do anything like that. Uh, basically, this is going to replace a, a popcorn hour I have, which is a, also Chinese rubbish uh, box, but the Popcorn Hour is no longer supported, doesn't play X265 uh, files, doesn't do 4K, so uh, it's starting to get a little long in the tooth, and uh, also the hard drive in it is going, so it's time to replace it with something. So uh, because I'm a glutton for punishment, I know all you smart guys and gals uh, put all your media files on a, a network attack storage on your network, maybe on your router, and then stream it to your Apple TV or your NVIDIA Shield or a thousand other uh, streaming devices, but I like having a little box with a hard drive locally that can play media and our power goes out so much here it, you know it's nice to have a self-contained unit that doesn't rely on the network or anything to play uh video files and i'm a glutton for punishment and i'm a software geek so i figured i could you know work my way through it this thing runs android uh, i say it has a mediatek processor in it but the first thing i wanted to do is it doesn't come with a battery to back up the uh real-time clock the uh, the reason i assume is that the the chinese don't want to get in trouble shipping batteries around, although the box did have a big uh, lithium-ion battery warning sticker on it, even though there's no batteries at all, not even for the remote in the in the package. But I want to go ahead and put a, uh, a battery to back up the real-time clock. And the other reason I want to do that, even though most people go, oh, you don't have to do that because it's on the network all the time and it gets its time from, you know, um, NTP uh, from the network. Uh, you know, and that's true. But as I say, our, our we have Comcast internet, so we're lucky if it stays up. And <laughs> and uh, uh, and the power goes out all the time, and I don't want the thing to lose time. And then I also figured it's likely that there's some bytes of parameter RAM, and certainly in the old days with PCs and the old, not too old days, you know, hard disk parameters and other important things would be kept in parameter RAM, and you, you don't want to have to reset those every time the power goes out. In fact, I was a little worried about that. Can you see this here? This is the hard drive door. Kind of look in there. There's a little warning here that says uh, when the power goes off, you're supposed to like pop the hard drive out and push it back in, which also makes me think that it like forgets it's some hard drive parameters. I have no evidence of this. I don't know. But anyway, I do before I do anything, I haven't even turned this on or plugged it in. I just took it out of the box. I, I, I want to put a, a battery into it. So the first problem was then how do you how do you get into this thing? And it comes with these. Uh, how am I doing on my? There we go. It comes with these, uh, you know, these these feet on the bottom. You pull these screws out, and then I was going, how do I get the bottom out? How do I get the bottom out? And I'm pulling on it, and I, nothing happened. Uh, there is nothing under this sticker. I lifted it and looked. There's nothing under this uh, sticker. Well, it turns out, once you take the screws out, the, the top is what comes out like this. Let's see if I can get it out now. Now that we're on camera, and the stakes are high. Tell you what, let me let me open the the drawer and then yeah, pop it out from from the inside and now you can take a look in there and let me lower this thing here maybe we can get close that is where the uh, battery goes and you know looking at the way this is constructed with uh, this in the middle and this on the side plus goes down and the minus will be picked up on the edge here um, and going by the forums, they say it takes a CR1220 battery. So I went to my local CVS. Of course, they didn't have it. Then I went to Batteries Plus. They did, but they'd only sell me two for 10 bucks. So, you know, it's like, great. Uh, but anyway, so we got it here. We'll put this in. thing is a hard drive. So I wanted to get a new hard drive because I said, as I said, the one in the popcorn hour is failing. So I've got a six terabyte drive coming. I don't know if the one in the popcorn hour was two or four. I can't remember, but it's getting full because someone keeps, you know, getting drunk and downloading movies off the internet, uh, apparently. The 1225 uh, might also work. I compared them in the Batteries Plus store. It's a little taller and it would last longer. So the only question is if this little tab right here would, would get in the way of it coming up higher. So I don't know, but I can tell you right now that the, uh, the 1220 fits perfectly. So anyway, I've got this uh, Barracuda hard drive, NAS hard drive coming tomorrow, and we'll talk about formatting that when you don't have a PC around to stick in this thing, and that should be an adventure. I don't know why 
this box can't format any hard drive you stick into it when it first comes in, or you can't telnet into it and do it on the command line or something, but maybe you can. Anyway, so we'll, we'll figure that out and put that up here. So naturally, when I plugged it in, nothing happened, just the fan spinning. This display didn't show anything, and I'd set up a monitor in the office to look at it, and that nothing was on that. So I've dragged it into the living room. In a last-ditch effort, I'm going to try to reflash the uh, operating system. We'll see if that uh, does anything. So I've downloaded the image onto a FAT32 drive. I've stuck it into the USB port. And I'm going to hold down the reset button over here while turning the power on. And we'll see if we get anything on the display or any sign of life. The instructions kind of imply that if you wait 10 minutes, it might come up. So maybe I should have done that. I don't know. But <laughs> what do you expect for you know, 350 bucks. Uh, so hang on just a second. And this is just as dead as before, so uh, let's wait 10 minutes. Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, starting now. So 10 minutes later and nothing, and I even went through the whole process a second time, and there's just no sign of life, just the fan running and nothing on the display. So uh, this seems to be DOA because I, I refuse to believe that uh, you know, me poking my fingers in there and putting a battery in and, uh, you know, zapping it with static electricity had anything <laughs> bad to do with it. So I'll take the battery out and send it back. I'll try it once again without the battery, but I don't think there's going to be any change. So, yeah, great. Let's do that. So the project from hell continues. The Z10 is on its way back to Mr. Bezos. And uh, today the Seagate Iron Wolf 6 terabyte drive arrived from Newegg, and I was just going to use this to see how it was partitioned. This is what I usually use. It's just a dumb uh, uh, cable adapter. Let me get this up in the air here. When I plugged the drive in, it made a bad noise, so I uh, decided to try drag out the old icy dock. These were nice units that uh, do USB and <clears throat> bring the SAT out as well, and you can just kind of pop them open like that and slide your drive in. Lock that up. And uh, now when we turn this on, we would like to hear the platter spin up and all kinds of good things happen. But unfortunately, that's not what's going to happen. Unfortunately, that beeping is the sound of uh, the heads are not in the parking zone. They're on the platter, and the platter can't spin because the heads are crashed into them. Uh, or there's some other problem with the spindle or the motor because uh, it's just not spinning up. So this is going back to Newegg. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Bezos. So obviously I'm starting to feel better about this $350 experience. This new unit is working. Went ahead and put the battery in, no problem. I don't think I was particularly clear last time I did this. There are six screws you have to take out. Four under the legs, and then when you take the front legs out, there are, there are two screws under those that have to come out too. But now it's booting up. We're getting an image on the monitor. Uh, the first time it booted, it went right into setup. Now it's going to the main menu. This is like the third boot or so. So I'll go ahead and configure some of this stuff. And now we're waiting for the replacement hard disk to come up from Newegg, it's on a slow boat, boat from LA. So when you plug in the ethernet, this uh, little enunciator comes on on the front screen. That's kind of cool. Looks to be a little hot, muggy, and rainy in Shenzhen today. Never gonna use the Wi-Fi. online all the versions were 6020 and 6090 I, I thought that would be pretty current but i guess they're in the 63 series i haven't been following the forums uh, right now it's the end of july 2021 maybe we can brick this thing right away <laughs> still using md5 message digest 5 to verify files that's kind of out of date these days. 
So we didn't break it after all, and the whole update process only took about three, four minutes, so not bad. And this thing boots fast. I mean, the popcorn hour would take like three minutes to come up. This thing comes up in 20 seconds or less, so that's nice. Let you take a look at the about screen after the update. Looks like you can use this thing as an access point, which is a nice touch if it works. Of course, it's the usual ridiculous UI. Sometimes menu gets you out, sometimes return gets you out, and sometimes the home key gets you out of whatever you're doing. And it's completely random. <laughs> So this replacement Seagate Iron Wolf drive spins up great. I don't know what the odds are that I'd order a hard drive and a computer for the same project and have them both be defective and have to be sent back, but the replacements are working okay. Anyway, the reason to make this video is to show how to use this as an internal drive in the Zito when you don't have a Windows machine, because if you read the forums, you'll see everyone is using Windows to format these drives with the NT file system, NTFS. Uh, but that's not ideal, actually, for the Zito, because the Zito runs Android, and Android is built on a Linux or Linux uh, kernel. And so, really, for optimal use, you'd, you'd want a file system that, that Linux uses, and those are the what we call the extended file systems, the EXT file systems, and uh, specifically uh, EXT4, or at least 3, if you can get away with it. So, honestly, those of us in the Mac community are in a better position than the Windows people, because we'll have a drive that... Uh, is more likely to have you know fewer problems with uh, with a Linux native kind of format. So if you st this drive is completely uninitialized as it comes from the factory, yours may or may not be. But if you stick it into the Macintosh, you'll see this dialog box. And since I don't know what initialize does, I go ahead and just uh, hit ignore, and that kind of leaves it connected but sitting there like a, a ghost. And what we want to do is go ahead and format this as an ext4 drive. And it's not that difficult. A lot of people, even a lot of technical people, uh, think that when you want to format a drive with a Linux file system, you have to either boot Linux from a flash drive or run it in a virtual machine. But that's not the case. There's an easier way that I will show you. There, you know, in an ideal world, you would plug this into the Zito, and it would say, uh, this drive's uninitialized. Shall I format it for you, master? But it doesn't seem to do that, although there is at least one report on the forums of a guy who stuck it in an external USB enclosure and, uh, and, and, it, and used his disk and then was able to stick it in the internal slot and have it work. Um, I don't know what his initial condition of his drive was, though, so it's hard to verify. I'm probably going to do a little experiment. I have already done an experiment with a small Mac store drive, and I found that when you stick any drive in the internal slot, a little USB enunciator comes on on the display, which gets me thinking that perhaps uh, even the internal drives are handled as, as USB drives in this thing, uh, that there's a USB interface, uh, you know, uh, between the, the, the microprocessor and uh, the, 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 uh, the SATA, uh, the serial attachment uh, interface uh, for all these drives. Which also means you shouldn't be afraid of USB, uh, because a lot of people, again, on the forums go, well, you know, you need want to directly connect your drive to the Zito, because the USB adds this whole other layer of complication. But I don't think that's the case. In the olden days, a computer was intimately concerned with the actual physical layout of uh, the recording surfaces in this enclosure. Uh, you know, there's a series of platters like Lazy Susan stacked up in here, and you had to know how many there were and how many sides and how many tracks and all this, all these parameters. These days, the controllers are all so smart that everyone, for the most part, uses what's called logical block addressing. So, essentially, this drive appears to the system as uh, a series of sectors from one to, you know, a bazillion, and he just deals with them as, you know, numbers of, of uh, storage units going off, you know, to the end of the drive. So I don't know that the USB um, direct connection stuff makes any particular difference. So I hope the more technical of you will indulge me for a minute. I want to talk about what we want to do to this drive in, in simple terms, and I'm going to use kind of a belabored metaphor to explain it. But imagine you bought an acre of property and it's just random dirt. That's essentially what this uninitialized drive is. It's a vast random space. And we want to put some structure on it. To use the metaphor, we want to build some buildings on our vacant lot. And to, so we divide the, the, the tract of land we have into different you know, parcels. 
And that's the same thing as dividing this big random space into what are called partitions. And uh, partitions show up as a drive letter in Windows or as volumes on the Macintosh. And, but then you need a way to find your way around this new neighborhood. So you need to put a map to the houses and it's put at the start of the disk or at the start of the property where everyone who comes can find it. And that's called the partition table. And there are two forms of partition table. There's one going back to the 80s called MBR, the master boot record, which was used to, you know, run early hard disks and even boot operating systems back a long time ago. And that still works great. And the Zito will actually use the um, MBR, sometimes called the F disk. Uh, that will still work. The problem with it is it only goes up to, it only can support a two terabyte uh, hard drive because in the 80s, uh, you know, a two terabyte drive was a fantasy. No one could imagine something being that large. So they only made space for numbers to go that big. Now to get around that limitation, and this is a six terabyte drive, we use something called a, uh, the GPT table, the, the GUID partition table, and GUID stands for a globally unique ID, which is a sort of random number that's so large that it, and randomly created that it's likely to be unique in the universe. So when you format a disk with that partition table or that map at the start, that kind of gives that drive a unique serial number, which is useful for when you're writing software for versioning and some other things we won't get into. Once you've taken that, so you have your map, you have a, your partitions, then inside those partitions you put what we call file systems, and that's like building different styles of houses, you know, a Victorian, a Mediterranean, a mid-century modern, uh, and there's a bazillion different file systems. There's just a whole bunch of them, and at Linux, the Linux file system was called the extended file system, or EXT, uh, and it had some innovations that I won't go into, but an EXT2 was kind of around the longest, and now we have EXT3 and 4, and we're going to format this EXT4. So what we really want to do is get to a place uh, for the Zito where we have a GUID partition table to support the big disk, and then one enormous partition for all our video files. So now we're on the Mac and the uninitialized Iron Wolf drive has been connected to it. And I blew by that dialogue I showed you before with a ignore. And the reason I don't say initialize there is because I want to absolutely control what is going to happen on the drive. And now we fired up disk utility, which I hope is familiar. It's uh, in applications utilities on most Macintoshes. And you can see the Seagate, these are all my hard drives here, and you can see the Seagate um, uninitialized drive is, is right there. And in fact, sometimes it's fun to uh, toggle this and then you get a more detailed display. So, so th as we were talking, this is a drive and this is a, a volume and a partition. This is a drive, this is a volume and a partition. Uh, but there aren't, and this is a drive, this is no um, uh, a partition, but, but, but there are no partitions on this uninitialized drive. So we're going to erase this and we're going to make it a uh, EX fat drive to start with. But the real reason we're doing this is to get a uh, GUID, a, a GPT partition table onto the drive, and also to make one big partition uh, with a format that the next tool we're gonna use can recognize before it overwrites it and changes it to EXT4. So we go up here to erase, uh, and we don't wanna do Mac OS extended, we'll go EX fat, and you wanna set that to GUID partition map, and uh, I don't know, what are we going to call this? Media. The, uh, the Zito doesn't seem, seems to make up its own names, and I haven't figured out how to rename devices on the Zito yet. But anyway, so now we'll erase this, and this will make the, the one big volume. We can, and that didn't take long at all. And so now there's a, a partition called Media on there and now we want to change this to be uh, ext4 so now you need to fire up a web browser and go to brew.sh which will take you to this page homebrew the missing package manager for mac os what is a package manager well packages are software programs and this is kind of an archive or repository of lots and lots of utilities most of them are command line and everything we're going to do now is on the command line so please don't be scared i'll try to go slow uh, through it a lot of you, I'm sure, already have Homebrew installed on your machine, uh, and you can look and see the, the description here. It's kind of written a little bit in technical ease, uh, and, but don't let all this scare you. Essentially, just do what it says to do here, which is uh, uh, copy this particular line of magic, 
and then go to a terminal. Let me hang on a second. And I've gotten myself to a command line and I hope you're able to get yourself to a command line. The easy way to do this on most Macs is to run the program called Terminal, which gives you black text on a white background by default. I'm using a fancier terminal called iTerm that I've configured to look like an amber CRT monitor I used back in, you know, 1998. Uh, called an Amdex 310A, so it's a nostalgia thing for me. Anyway, you have that command line from the Brew website in your, on your clipboard, the install command. So if we paste that in here, and uh, I'm not going to even talk about what this is going to do, how it works. But anyway, if you hit return now, this will go run some scripts and install the whole Brew system on your machine, which is basically a, a catalog of all the available packages or programs that it has available. I'm not going to do it because I already have it installed on my machine. But anyway, once you get through that, that process, and I hope this isn't like the old Steve Martin joke where he says, you can become a millionaire and never pay taxes. And then he says, first, get a million dollars. You know, so Ward says this is easy, but the first thing I have to do is install this crazy brew nonsense. But trust me, once you get the brew system installed, then we can ask it to bring us a package of Unix command line um, disk formatting utilities. So we want to talk to Brew. We say, hey, Brew, I'd like to install uh, E2 for the EX2 file system, even though this has utilities for X2, X3, X4 uh, uh, file system programs or progs. I already have this installed on my machine, so let's see what he does when I hit return. He's already installed and up to date. So I'm, I'm all ready to go. And now we can go ahead and uh, start the process of uh, setting up our EX FAT drive now as an EXT4 drive for the Zito. One of the great conceptual innovations created by Unix in the 1970s was the idea that devices could be kind of like files and that you could open them, read them, or write them. So you could read from a keyboard and write to the screen. Same thing, you can open a a disk and read and write to it. So disks in the command line world uh, appear as pseudo files. They have names, they look like any other file. And they're in a magic place called dev slash dev. And so we want to now find our uh, Seagate uh, media EX fat drive and how it's represented in this strange command line world. And it turns out that disk utility the graphical one we used to format this originally has a command line side to it. it. It can it can be operated from the command line. So, and that is, we call it disk util. We say, hey, disk util, could you please list all the disks on my machine? And it does, and some of them scrolled off the top of the screen there. But if you look here at the very bottom, you can see the one we formatted with the GUID partition scheme and the name media. And right here in this corner, it says that that is called, oops, what did I do there? Mess that up. Let's, let's bring that back. It says, oops, oh my. Uh, it says that, uh, <laughs> oh well, let's do this. <laughs> a, it says that, um, the disk is called dev disk six. So now we know the name of our drive. We want to be sure that nobody's using it and disk utility after it formatted it probably left it connected to the operating system. And the geek term for that is mounted. So, and that goes back to tape drives, mounting reels of tape, and then, and then having all the stuff on the tape appear at a certain point in the file system called the mount point. But anyway, that's all beside the point. Um, we want to make sure the disk is unmounted now so that we can uh, format it. So the command for that is, I'll clear the screen, disk util unmount disk, and it was dev uh, disk six. And now it's all unmounted, and now we can actually really start to play with it. Now that the drive has been unmounted, let's go back to disk util and get it to show us information just about our new drive, which is disk six on my machine. It'll probably be a different number on yours. And you can see that um, 
zero, this first line here, it has to do with the device as a whole. Interesting thing is, he thinks disk, disk six is only 1.6 terabytes. I think it's a six terabyte drive. So I'm curious to see now if I'm gonna get my full six terabytes off of this thing. Uh, then there's one partition here, which has um, uh, data, data related to um, the basic input output system, starting up the system, we can ignore it. But you can see the name here for that is disk six, you know, section one, actually slice one, but partition one for our purposes. And then here is our big drive called media, which is the one we want to format. That again, I think should be six terabytes, but is only 1.6. So we'll see what happens. But its name is disk six S2, slice two. So let's go ahead now and we're going to run a formatting utility that Brew brought down. So first we want to find out where Brew put it. So we say, hey Brew, what is the prefix of uh, the E2FS probs? Where did you where did you put them? And he says, hello master there in user local opt the E2FS progs. So, and in fact, we can copy this and we can paste it. And then in there, there is a directory called sbin for shared binaries. And now here's the magic program. We want to make a file system, mkfs dot, and the one we want to make is ext4. And let's see if we've actually found the program first. Okay, so now we are talking to the program. I can hit control P on my machine and bring that line back. Uh, so which device do we want to format as ext4? We want to do dev disk. 6s2. And it's not enough just to uh, run this. We need to run it at, with all power in the universe. So we need to run it as super user. So we say super user do, sudo, do all these things. So what we're doing is running a program called sudo. And he looks at the command line and will raise our privileges and let us run this program as root effectively. And the reason we need to do that is because we're going to be um, especially to close the disk, we need uh, godlike permissions to, um, to, to, to read, write, and close the, close the disk. So this is what you want to execute on your machine with uh, your particular disk name being whatever it is you found with the list program. And I'm curious how long this is going to take, if it's going to be hours or whatever. So I'm going to run a program bef before this called time. So I want to time the SU do da 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 so let's see if this works and uh, how much uh, stuff we get. I figure this this may take hours. It may take minutes. I don't know. Uh, does this all look right? Let's see what happens. He wants to know my password to be root, which is just your regular user password if you're an administrator on the system. And here we go. And he goes, oh, look, he found it. He says, I see there's a EX fat system on there called media. Shall we erase it? I'm going to go, yes. And hit return. And now we wait. Okay, it's later. And the good news is it only took one minute and 20 seconds to do that. The bad news is that it did indeed only format it as a 1.6 terabyte drive. If you multiply this number by uh, 4096, which is the size of a 4K block, you come up with 1.6 terabytes. So while I have a drive I can stick in the Zito now, it's too small. It should be six. So did I mess up in disk utility? Did I make somehow make a partition that wasn't a full six terabytes? Or is this, <laughs> did they send me the wrong drive? So that's the next thing to find out, hang on. Ah, well, it seems like I'm not the only person who's had this happen. And it seems the reason is because I'm using this ancient icy dock enclosure and the firmware in it doesn't understand great big hard drives. So let me use my raw cable system, which is a more recent vintage. And I'm sorry I didn't notice this as we were in disk utility. So there's a lesson for you. Look at disk utility and make sure it's showing the right size drive. I know I said, don't be afraid of USB, but I guess I meant don't be afraid of recent USB. So I can get up to this more modern cable only interface and it's saw it just fine, formatted it again. And it still only took a minute and 25 seconds, worked fine. All right, so finally, now if we take this EXT formatted drive and stick it in here, Zito is spinning it up. It's 
go over here and look at the device list. And there we are, something's changed. We'll scroll down. And there is the drive. I don't know how to change that name yet. Um, and you'll notice over here, uh, let's see if we can get this here. Ooh. He says I can press the left key to unmount it. So I think all the drives, the internal and the external, they're all talked to through a USB interface. In fact, if I do the left arrow thing, um, this comes up. Anyway, that's it. Now there's nothing to do except uh, <laughs> spend hours uh, copying several terabytes of uh, movies and video files onto this thing, either over the network or by directly attaching the disc from the popcorn hour. I'm not sure which I'm going to do. Thanks for bearing with me and watching, and uh, like, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.